I know you've heard you should get a VPN over and over again, and there's a reason for that. It is absolutely true. It will keep you safe and anonymous online. That's especially important for me for the type of stuff that I read and search for while making my videos. But there are a million reasons to get a VPN, whether it's to protect you from online hackers, or companies, websites, advertisers, and your ISP from tracking what websites you visit and what you are buying online. When looking for a VPN, you want to make sure that you get the best, with all the features available. They are not all equal. And the best out there, at least in my opinion, is NordVPN. And that's why I team up with them. It's the VPN I use, and they have every feature you could possibly want. They now have over 5,200 servers that you can connect to, and they do not log your data, which is important. And the company is actually registered in Panama. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing is allowed. It has unlimited bandwidth, double data encryption, up to six simultaneous connections, a Google Chrome extension, Onion over VPN servers, just to name a few. It even works in countries like China, which is known for the so-called Great Chinese Firewall, also in Middle Eastern countries as well. But you do not have to take my word for it. They are always highly recommended by technology experts, and the only VPN to get all green check marks by PC Mag. They also just won the 2019 VPN Award, so there is no doubt that you will be getting the best with Nord. So the only real issue is price. Well, if you use my link here, you will get 75% off. Not 25 or 50, 75%. I know when I was looking for a VPN, price is a consideration, just another expense I'd have every month but with 75% off, that is more than affordable. They also offer a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you do not like them, you can cancel and get your money back. I'll put the link down in the description, so make sure you use it so you can get that 75% off. And also so they know that I sent you. Or you can just use a coupon code, Covert Cabal, no space. Again, that is NordVPN. The history of the conflict between Israel and Syria goes way back back to the very first days of the existence of the State of Israel. In 1948, one day after Israel declared its independence, Syria, along with Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt attacked. Ever since that first war, tensions have remained extremely high, escalating to armed conflict on multiple occasions. The reasons for these relations are deep and complex, and highly argued, way too much to even attempt to get into in this video. But for those who don't know, a very, very basic overview of the current situation can pretty much be boiled down to Israel versus Iran. You can almost think about it like the US and Soviet Union during the Cold War. Israel and Iran are in their own version of a Cold War, so to say. Not outright fighting each other in an all-out war, but fighting a war politically, economically, covertly through espionage and even sabotage and assassinations, and fighting through proxies. Syria is a close ally of Iran, and could be considered, to an extent, an Iranian proxy. Iran has helped prop up and arm Assad, the president of Syria, and also known to fund groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon, a group considered to be a terrorist state by many Western and even Middle Eastern countries. So Israel's objective in Syria is to stop Iran and its allies from expanding and building up military forces on their border. Israel views this as a major security concern, especially considering the fact that many Iranian officials have called for the destruction of Israel, including Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini. Israel has found an unlikely ally, if you can call it that, in Saudi Arabia against Iran. Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have historically been at odds, fighting each other directly in 1948, in the Six Day War in 1967, and again in 1973. But in recent years, the Saudis recognize Iran as the largest threat to the regional power. And the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Israel and Saudi Arabia have reportedly been working together to counter Iran, even sharing intelligence. Leaked Israeli cables, which are confidential messages sent between government personnel, reveal that the two countries are working to escalate conflicts in the region to put diplomatic pressure on Iran, particularly against Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Iranian-backed Houthi in Yemen. But Saudi Arabia has also been highly involved in the Syrian civil war. They helped train and arm the opposition fighting against Assad. Israel has officially stated that they are neutral in respect to the civil war, but unofficially have been reported to support the opposition party fighting Assad by arming, training, and providing intelligence, along with Saudi Arabia, the CIA, and other Western intelligence agencies. But the most notable Israeli actions have been the airstrikes, Israel has carried out over 100 airstrikes throughout the war, although they usually do not admit responsibility. 
These airstrikes target Iranian forces and weapon shipments from Iran to Hezbollah and Syria. While typically not claiming any individual attack, the IDF did recently state that in 2017 and 2018, Israel had struck over 200 Iranian targets in Syria alone. Operation Chess is the official reported name of these strikes. And I know I need to say this carefully, and this is not in any way promoting or glorifying war or ignoring the damage, destruction, and loss of life that has occurred. But from a military perspective, these strikes have been quite interesting. There have been many different tactics, weapons, and targets, along with relatively modern air defense attempting to stop them. Despite the misinformation and propaganda put out by both sides, we are able to get a glimpse into how some of these newest and most advanced systems work and find out just how effective they are in modern combat. Syria has a large mix of extremely old, relatively old, and modern air defense systems of all types, short, medium, and long range. The older but still capable S-75s, 125s, and 200s, to the newer Buck and Pantsir systems recently received from Russia. Israel has also used a wide variety of weapons, most of which have been standoff range weapons, so that the aircraft launching them can stay out of range of Syrian air defenses. One popular weapon is Delilah, a cruise missile. These fly low, close to the ground to avoid detection and limit reaction time. This weapon has been known to be used in Syria, along with IAI, Harup, and Harpy. These two are interesting. They're basically small drones with a small warhead inside. They are slow, but cheap allowing many of them to be used. It is also possible that a new weapon has been used. There have been reports that a brand new supersonic cruise missile known as Rampage has been used in Syria. Its fast speed makes reaction and interception much more difficult. And finally, the SDB, or small diameter bomb. These have been used extensively and many pictures have popped up on social media of debris of these weapons. I've talked about this weapon many times, but it's a glide bomb, not a missile, meaning that its range is dependent on the altitude it is dropped from. These weapons are small, many aircraft can carry 8 of them at a time, some even 16. They are also relatively inexpensive, so you can fire off many more than you can of the big expensive cruise missiles. However, flying at high altitudes means Syrian air defenses will be able to detect the aircraft coming, giving little hope of surprise. Interestingly. Russia has claimed that Israel is using civilian air traffic and even Russian flights to help hide Israeli aircraft coming into attack. This is what happened, Russia claims, was responsible for the shootdown of one of their aircraft in September of 2018. In response, Russia has given Syria at least one S-300 system. It is located in western Syria, up in a mountain, which gives a radar a good view of the surrounding area. It's most likely active by now. However, it has still not been used to defend against recent Israeli strikes. Its use is likely highly controlled by Russia, as if it is used, Israel will likely attack it in response, and if they succeed in destroying it, it will be a huge propaganda loss for Russia, and could hurt future air defense sales to other countries of the S-300 and even the newer S-400. And this isn't to say the S-300 is horrible, or a paper tiger like many like to say online. While it hasn't yet been used in combat anywhere, it is likely very capable, but any system can be overwhelmed. The site in Syria only has four TELs, or launchers, so that is only 16 missiles it could fire before having to have to reload, which could take at least a half hour. So it can be saturated if you throw enough at it. I don't think I'm allowed to show the images due to copyright, but you can check out ImageSat International. They release tons of awesome satellite imagery of this S-300 site and many more things, including images of the recent Israeli attacks. I have a link to their Twitter here in the top right to click on. So besides the S-300, Syria's mix of air defense systems have been left to defend against these attacks. As expected, Syria almost always claims that they shot down all Israeli missiles, or at least most of them, and Israel almost always claims the opposite. The truth is likely somewhere in the middle. They are obviously successfully hitting targets, as we have satellite imagery, but it is likely that these air defense systems are making it more and more difficult to do so. Videos released by Israel show them hitting Pantsir short-range air defense systems, but you can also see in the video that they are empty and reloading, or in this one, is currently engaging other Israeli weapons. You can tell in the clip that it is a Pantsir system, firing most likely the 57E6 missile, which burns for 2 seconds, at which point its booster separates. 
You can then make out an explosion off to the side. This could be anything, honestly. It could be the missile intercepting an Israeli weapon, or it could be self-destructing after missing, or even be thrown off course by Israeli electronic warfare, although that one is unlikely. Unfortunately, we can't tell from this footage alone. However, at this point, Assad and his government have all but won the civil war. Israeli hopes of removing Assad and by extension, ending Iranian presence in Syria has all but evaporated. At best, Israel can continue to apply enough pressure on Russia and Syria through continued airstrikes on Iranian targets to get them to sign an agreement keeping Iran's operations in the region limited. This, however, also carries a risk of Russia changing its stance on Israel and use its military in the region to stop Israeli strikes. Recently, Russia has mostly looked the other way to these Israeli strikes. Russia's position in the region is pretty complicated. They are on Assad's side, and to a lesser extent, Iran's. But at the same time, they're trying to keep Israel happy to avoid escalating the war. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has met with Putin at least nine times since the start of the war, which is more times than he has met with any other world leader. They do currently have an agreement to keep Iranian forces 85 kilometers away from the border of Israel, which interestingly enough includes Syria's capital of Damascus. They also seem to have a private agreement that as long as Israel keeps these operations secret and does not claim responsibility publicly, and they are limited to Iranian targets, Russia will not take action. But after recent events, that could change. And if it does, Israel may be powerless to stop Iran from setting up right on their doorstep. Also, we just started a podcast called Tech Ops. Go on over and check it out. I have it linked here in the description. We've had a lot of cool people on, Josh Dean, H.I. Sutton, and many more to come. Check it out.